Hey everybody, uh, welcome to the City Sats training room here at the City County Building. My name is Henry Horn Pyatt. Today's session is called For Profit Cooperatives How They Work. Uh, basically, I'm sure this is true for a lot of you guys too. Here uh, in city government, in many of the council offices, in my, uh, in my job as well, uh, doing small business and neighborhood revitalization for the mayor, we've received a lot of interest and inquiries from folks interested in cooperatives. Um, but some folks know what they're looking for and they understand that this may be an instrument to help a larger swath of people be able to invest in and have an ownership stake in a business whereas other people um, get co-ops confused with things like co-working or communism um, and um, frankly it's neither of those um, so we're here today after our previous session in December which in broad strokes discussed what a cooperative is and the fact that a cooperative is a, is a system of governance for a business that can be organized under almost any of the different um, business structures that are legal in Pennsylvania. Today we're going to get more in depth. Today we're going to talk about some of the different uh, governance structures that are being used by co-ops here in Pittsburgh, some of the ones being used in other cities, um, some different theories of governance, uh, and we're going to have lots and lots of time for Q&A. The idea here is that the Pittsburgh Chamber of Cooperatives, which is a group of um, folks who are working together to help explain to the rest of Pittsburgh how co-ops work and help uh, folks start them, um, they're, they're embarking on this educational mission, and we wanted to make sure to connect all the business technical assistance providers and other folks who are helpers in the city with them so that they can be available when folks want to avail themselves of their ability. Um, and because even though cooperatives have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years here uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, or at least 200 years here in Pennsylvania, um, they're still not very well understood or very popular or very common. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ron Gatos. He is part of the Pittsburgh Chamber of Cooperatives and he's gonna be our professor for the afternoon. Please feel free to ask lots of questions, but uh, we're gonna have a little bit of a presentation at first and then a very long Q&A at the end. And once we get to Q&A, uh, we'll pass around a microphone so that we, we can record this uh, for YouTube so that other people can watch it for their edification later on. Um, thanks again for coming and uh, here's Ron. Pause. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Nice to see you. Um, I'm just going to slide this over here and have my laptop here so I won't get in anybody's way. Real quick, I just thought I of that you. when you were talking. Thanks. We're in business, and co-ops are in business. Um, so uh, just how do they work? This is what we want to talk about. Uh, I'll give you first some background on the Chamber of Co-ops. Uh, there's a few members here, uh, Pinup Couriers, someone from Work Hard, and um, who else? Hi, Dylan. So we're the hands-on resource for member and, and um, worker-owned businesses in the Pittsburgh region. And our motto is think outside the boss. We, as Henry said, we facilitate uh, a lot of things cooperative and work with uh, housing co-ops a little bit, um, consumer co-ops a bit more, and we're really working hard on worker co-ops. We're also um, right now beta testing a um, member-owned platform, something like Uber TaskRabbit, where members can share in the profits that the platform generates. So instead of it all going to Wall Street or Silicon Valley investors, it comes back to the members, the customers and the workers who would be doing the services that you can find on that website, ourcovivi.us. So if you're interested, check it out. Um, we're supported by New Sun Rising. It's who, they're our fiscal sponsor. Um, Senior Strategies is my firm and we, we, we actually just pay a lot for the hosting and other business services that the Chamber uh, does. Neighborhood Allies was generously um, supporting us uh, for the last three years with a small grant so that we can do programs like this. Um, so here's what you said uh, when you came in uh, and RSVP'd. A lot of people want to know about business planning, legal uh, and registration about uh, co-ops as well as regulations and compliance issues and things like that and how they're different. Um, much on marketing. The good news is if you're worried about uh, how is co-ops, how is a cooperative going to market itself, 
you're in the market with everyone else anyway, for the most part. So your um, um, marketing is going to be uh, oriented toward the market that you're in, whatever business sector that is. Um, there are intangibles such as the goodwill and community support um, that cooperatives are usually uh, take to heart. And um, that's also another uh, really good marketing point for cooperatives. So what we'd like you to walk out with are how cooperatives are developed and how they operate, what their structure's like, how they're governed, and what local opportunities there are. Basic definition, it's a member-owned enterprise for collective goals that's democratically governed. Based on these principles, um, and then most uh, we'll, we'll be focusing on the member economic participation, democratic member control, um, and probably education, training, and open information as well. Those principles come back to here, Rochdale, England in 1844, uh, as England began to industrialize, workers couldn't even afford food, uh, and they got banded together and formed a, a consumer co-op called the Rochdale Society of Equitable Pioneers. And it's a story right there that's been absorbed by the um, co-op market. It's a cooperative market that is really large in England and the United Kingdom. And is still in business today. This location is still in business today. But Pittsburgh being the innovative center that it is, the first cooperative that we could find on record is 1819, right there on Wood Street between what was um, Front Street, now First Avenue, and Second Avenue. It, uh, it was founded in response to mass production. A lot of artisans gathered materials, uh, I mean, uh, collectively bought materials, shared space for their work and distribution. And it ran for about 20 years. So it, it's great, uh, and here we go again in Pittsburgh, leading the way. And there are several others, you know, each decade. Uh, history sort of shows that economic stress and disruptions, mass business failures and things like that is the opportunity to start cooperatives. Um, and that's what you can see from um, things like the uh, Knights of Labor, the Holy and Noble Order of the Knights of Labor is their <laughs> full name. 1860s or so. They founded cooperatively owned mines and foundries from the um, Ohio Valley all the way up to New England. Several of them that worked for into the 1880s very uh, well. They were actually another um, cutting edge organization because while uh, unions and other organizations really instituted a lot of discrimination in their hiring practices and their advancement practices, they admitted women, they admitted Native Americans, they admitted African Americans uh, into their, into the union and co-op. So that's just another tradition that we have to be able to advance in, in the region. So you've probably had a chance to read all of those and find out what they are. I will show you some of the, the cooperatives that are around here. Um, a couple of them are represented here, Work Hard, um, Pin Up Couriers, the many well-known, many uh, not so well-known. Allegheny Solar Cooperative is going to be in, uh, installing their <coughs> cooperative investment fund that will be installing uh, community solar projects around the region. And they are about to install their first project. Big Idea Bookstore is another, it's great. Um, one, the East End Cooperative Ministry is a uh, social service cooperative among um, Christian and Jewish and I think a um, Muslim congregation that <coughs> provides social services together. They actually helped to found the East End Food Co-op. So it's principle seven, cooperation among co-ops. There's six main types, consumer, um, housing cooperatives. I'm going to go down in the order of how many there are in the area, in, in the whole country. This is United States wide. Um, producer or marketing co-ops, those are uh, like Ocean Spray, Land O'Lakes, 
uh, purchasing co-ops. There's several around the, the country, several around the region where just supply, supply purchases and things like that are uh, expedited by uh, with those. Worker-owned cooperative businesses is probably the, the smallest number and um, th several groups around the country are working or not on that to double, triple, hopefully quadruple that number in the near future. And uh, multi-stakeholder cooperatives are really cooperatives of cooperatives or cooperatives that have different divisions that do different things. It could be like uh, a simple one would be a bakery, which is worker owned, which also is part of a cooperative to do joint purchasings for other bakeries. And yeah, Henry. Uh, out in Allentown, Pennsylvania, there's Hospital Central Services Corporation, and that's where a bunch of hospitals needed blood labs, and they thought, why have, have our own blood lab, and we could just make the co-op and have a big central operation that's cheaper for all of us. Exactly, uh, yeah. And th that's so subversive, because it's a co-op and nobody knows it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's, it, that's one of the, the one of the great benefits. It uh, helps to bring an economy of scale and helps to uh, have mutual decision making and, or mutual benefit how they work. So now I have a pop quiz. Which one is the cooperative? And um, <laughs> you got one. Yeah, it, it's a trick question. They all are. Um, Ace Hardware, this is just a, a plain old garage up in Massachusetts. They, the owner decided to sell it to his workers and now they've all, they've all become a cooperative. New Era Windows was crashing and burning uh, by its former owner. A new owner took it over and couldn't make it go and uh, they locked themselves in and until they had an investment from the Working World uh, Cooperative Development Fund in New York City to purchase it and then they're, they're off and running. Uh, Best Western Hotels was a surprise to me, and they're, they're a, uh, they have a big purchasing co-op. Here's a, a map of worker cooperatives in the U.S. So you can see they're, they're basically about the densi same density as business in general throughout the country. The, the green ones are uh, U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives members. Oh. And this is a breakdown of the service, or of the, um, sectors that they're in. Service is largest, so it also seems to be that uh, that's one of the largest sectors in the economy too. That's why that's so large, but uh, provides a lot of opportunity for cooperative development. This is an interesting one. Once you get over 10 employees in the company, cooperatives have a much higher proportion of their uh, of businesses in the sector. So for instance, of companies 10 to 49 uh, in size, 38% uh, of them of co-ops are that large as opposed to only 20% of conventional companies are of that size. So it's a structure that, that lends itself to getting larger and large enough so that it can do business more uh, robustly. Am I explaining that clearly? Is it that co-ops tend to be, have fewer employees or fewer member employees than a typical company? Is that the point? No, the point is that of companies of any given size, um, of, of, oak, of all co-ops, 38% of them are uh, have 10 to 49 worker members, but only 20% of conventional companies are of that size. So we're looking at the blue stripe, which is cooperatives. They tend to be larger um, in any given size, except it's about even between 100 and 249 um, employees or member owners. So, um, is there, should we be like extrapolating from that that co-ops work better with more than 10 people or with more than um, it's, This is skewed because almost 90 percent, uh, I can't remember, uh, I will not uh, stake my life on that figure, but the vast majority of small businesses are one person. 
and so you can't really be a cooperative with one to two people. That's a part, either a sole proprietorship or a partnership, and three or more are, is generally what, what people will, will say is a cooperative if they have that structure. So be, uh, after 10 employees, cooperatives have a, a larger proportion of their set um, at, at a higher size, which um, the advantage to that is they uh, have more presence in the economy, they can have better economy of scale, they might be able to do larger projects, things like that. Here's an opportunity, 150,000 to 300,000 businesses are owned by baby boomers and they're candidates for takeovers, um, hopefully not shutdowns, and, or uh, moving on to new ownership. So. They could be, uh, many of them could be made, uh, converted into cooperatives, either by the owner or the acquiring party. So in about 15 years, there's going to be about 1, 000, 1 million employees affected in those companies. Is anybody here working with firms in their neighborhoods that, are, that have ownership that's aging out and thinking about retirement? This is a big question that everybody's talking. Uh, I worked in the Mon Valley for a long time, and there were all kinds of fabricators and um, small foundries and, and uh, distributors, companies like that that were just coasting till the owner got old enough to, for them to retire, and then it was either going to disappear or somebody had to do something. And it's um, just so much easier to take a company over than it is to start a new one in most cases. Some of the benefits are. Um, ownership and uh, more equitable wealth and compensation. Um, it's, it's, if you have a viable company that's a co-op, you own a piece of it and that's something that you can leverage for other things, to grow the business or um, uh, for your own purposes within uh, co uh, the, the structure of the co-op. Obviously more control over working conditions too because they're, they're governed democratically and um, the figure where worker owners get about 15 percent to as high as 70 percent higher pay if they're working in a cooperative it comes from studies that uh, prospera.com, uh, prosperacoops.org is the website. Prospera is an organization that, that founded several um, cooperatives out of uh, the LA area just for things like house cleaning and home health care and things like that. So um, poor women were, I mean poor uh, women with the difficult conditions were having to travel from north to south LA and just uh, for part-time hours and things like that and Prospera organized the co-ops for them so that they would be able to determine what region they worked in and um, they found they could make it go and at the same time get paid more and who doesn't want that? Um, for the business ownership and business viability point um, Turnover is really low compared to conventional businesses. So that's another good thing. Co-ops are not the knight in shining armor coming to save everything. Uh, for many people it's new and I've, we've had many people approach us when their business is not going to, uh, it w really didn't seem like it was going to continue the way it was and maybe we could just <laughs> wave a magic wand at it and then it would, everything would be okay. But it's, uh, it's not that, it ha you know, there, just like anything else there has to be pretty hard headed business planning involved. It's just not a company with a great boss. Um, that's another thing. And they're not charities, uh, as Henry said. So how, would we, how do we start them? They're either from the ground up, like many businesses, or uh, converted, converting from an existing business. From the ground up, there's all the similar business planning that, that uh, everybody's always working on. Anyway, you know, from the legal form, ownership, capital structure, how profits are distributed, the governance and management, and uh, what happens if you sell it or sell parts of it. Some examples of uh, cooperatives that have come up f uh, from the ground up are um, Fourth River Workers Guild is a small construction company around here. Um, East End Food Co-op, 
uh, Union Cab, uh, Prospera down, uh, over in LA, uh, New York City Home Care Associates, they have 2,500 uh, men members, which is huge. The Evergreen cooperatives were starting up. Mondragon is like the holy grail of cooperatives all over the world. It started in, 19, in the 20s, incorporated in 1956. So it does have 74,000 uh, worker members and about 17 billion in, in revenue every year throughout mainly Europe, but they do a lot of business here in North America. They make things like bicycles and um, appliances. They're into finance, insurance, and banking as well. So in 60 years, look what we can have. So, and uh, conversions, you, we do get a head start because there's a lot of things already in place. But legal form may change. Ownership will change, uh, sometimes not completely. Many owners stay in. If they convert it, they, c they stay in, uh, in the co-op after they, they convert from sole proprietorship or a closely held company to a cooperative. Um, allocation of profits ob obviously will change. Uh, governance and management does change. Um, so there's a foundation very often for a cooperative to be formed from a, an existing company. Um, and what, what I don't have here is that there is already operations in the market that the company is actually making sales and they're um, able to, they're able to um, basically they're changing drivers <laughs> and, and um, some of the uh, and the workplace culture as well. Yeah, they're keeping their product identity. They're keeping their talented workers. They're keeping their relationships with customers. Yeah, New Era is a really good example of that. They w made really good vinyl windows out of the Chicago area, and they never stopped making really good vinyl windows. It's just uh, changed from Republic to New Era, and uh, everybody's happier. They're making more, and it's growing. It's so it's, it's been a really good uh, thing to happen there. For something like that, it was 250 people be laid off and the place liquidated or everything come together and form the, the new company to do the, the same business, make the same product that was made before. So there's about uh, four types. Uh, the owner, if they sell to the worker and stay with the company, that's one. Uh, another is uh, selling to the workers but just leaving. Um, sometimes that happens. There's uh, sometimes the owner decided to go cooperative and didn't really keep anybody. <laughs> that's rare. There's usually a hybrid. They, they decide to turn into a cooperative. They keep some people. Some people don't want to do that and they leave and then new people come on. That's more common. Um, and sometimes they leave and start a co-op together. Here's some examples coming up to see. The Penham Auto, that blue barn in the picture that I showed you that was uh, five or six mechanics and salespeople who, who um, took over the, the um, auto shop up in Massachusetts. Work Hard Pittsburgh was two guys who decided they wanted to become cooperative. Um, and make that happen. And uh, decision making, ownership, and has, uh, has been figured out and the culture is being adopted. Um, so maybe, Anthony, you could speak a little bit to that in a little bit. That'd be great, yeah. Um, other things, you know, industrial companies like New Era Windows, Select Machine, Select Machine, um, they made machining uh, equipment there in Kent, Ohio. Um, but it's um, noticeable money too, and and really good jobs and and people, a significant amount of people. Just uh, things like cleaning, um, simple diaper and linen was a company where um, the owner decided they wanted to make it co-op. So some people left and some people came on, and they've been um, a um, they have a lot of dependable customers in the healthcare industry over in um, Massachusetts, I forget which city. And Malharleka cleaning was really fascinating because that formed from the Damayan Collective, which was a, an organization to, uh, whose mission was 
to help resettle uh, victims of human trafficking from the Philippines and they set them up in cleaning. They decided they wanted to do that so much it made more sense for them to start the company separate from Damayan and that that's where Mount Harlaika was, was born. So there's um, dozens of people involved in that and they're all busy. It's a really good thing. So and many types of businesses, four star video, a construction company, Key Figures does uh, tax and accounting, uh, in-source renewables, Blue Dot, a law, law firm, and uh, Center Point Counseling up in Wisconsin. Um, if anybody needs to know more, I'm just going to go over like investment. There's really simple, it, it's, it's ver fairly simple how they get started. Um, sometimes people just kick in, they say, okay, let's work together and they bring their tools. Sometimes there's more than that. They would invest for what ne is needed to establish the business together. Um, sometimes by how much they can afford at the time, sometimes equally. It's just as varied as there are businesses. So uh, that's, and then they set a value together. So if somebody you know, uh, puts in a thousand, somebody else puts in two, somebody else puts in three, somebody else puts in another one, um, they have to work out proportionally what the value of their investment is uh, in comparison to the total company. Sometimes, some people don't even want to go that far, they just are going to do the business. They said, we have what we need to get started, let's start making sales. I suspect that's how many start in the beginning. And then, um, common other methods, there's, when you said hundreds of years, the lending circles is a really old method of, of finance in many cultures. Tenda in the uh, Hispanic culture, Isusu in African culture, um, the Hoi in Chinese culture, this, they're all over. And then uh, other ways is, is external, that's uh, more common to other businesses, uh, or, or it's common to other businesses as well. Uh, debt through banks, but there's several um, cooperative development funds. The working world is a big one, New York City, North Country Co-op Development Fund in um, the Northern Midwest National Trust Community Development Corporation, and a new one that just started last year, the end of last year, uh, the Northwest Pennsylvania Investment Cooperative is dedicated to um, finding uh, investors to make um, investments in economic development activities in the Meadville area up in Crawford County. And uh, a cooperative can also sell preferred stock, which is investment based. They're looking for a return, but they're not going to have voting rights in that. Here's a couple of examples of structures. Here's one we know pretty well, nice and siloed. Um, there are others uh, like uh, the Blue Scorcher Artisan Cooperative over in Portland, which the general circle where everybody's involved, if they have anything that everybody has to deal with, they uh, figure out what they're going to do, they decide among that circle. But then there are several functional circles like there for bread, this is pastry, this is the kitchen, this is trans delivery or transportation. So they have the authority to do what they need to do within that circle. And if there's anything they need to take then to the general circle, they do that. Um, and they happen to have a board that I are, is delegated from each of the circles plus the general membership. Um, that starts to look a little bit like a board and committee structure, but there's uh, some differences if there, if, uh, in terms of how the decisions are actually made. A few things about different entity types. Um, here's different kinds of cooperatives. The worker cooperative, a cooperative corporation, which is, um, can be a worker cooperative, but it's much larger. Um, this is a, a C Corp, it's a sub under the subchapter T, uh, of, for cooperatives that allows profits to be passed through that corporation so it's not taxed as much directly to members as dividends where anyone with income uh, that gets evaluated for tax. And then uh, employee stock ownership plans is uh, uh, another one. Sometimes they're just hierarchical companies that are owned by the employees as a, in a stock fund. It's basically that is a retirement fund that they've invested in which 
um, finances the company. And then when they leave the company, they have their, what they've paid into to that back. Um, so that's how that works, basically how that works in a, in, in to, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of places use indirect pension as capital funds, like unions will do a lot of construction for union, ba union labor projects around the country, but um, they're doing that for themselves, right? There's, that's one of the strict, most strictly regulated forms, uh, as well as subchapter T, but the ESOP is really one of the most strictly regulated forms because it is people's retirement funds, so there's a lot of federal law that regulates that. Hey, since we're getting into questions, I think that's great, but I'm yeah. going to repeat people's questions so that anybody watching the video later Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead, Dave, Dylan. Um, I was just going to, for clarity on, on ESOPs, um, if I understand that right, you don't have voting, voting power in the, in the operations of the business, but you might, similar to like an investment fund, have, you know, like a voting right on that. So yeah. there's a difference. There, so they, in, a, in, oh, a, yeah. in an Go employee ahead. stock ownership program, um, the question is, to what extent does each individual employee stock owner have, uh, have uh, one share, one vote of the company? Does that differ? Is it always the same? How much power do they have? It, it's, um, it varies from the company board makes all the decisions to employees do get a vote. Because there are ESOPs that are just plain employee-owned by stock, stock ownership, and there are ESOPs that are also um, member-owned and governed, where they where they do vote for that. So it's it depends on the the will of the company, the owners, the new the new members, and um, and what works in the market. You know, there are some where they might have the um, they might have room you know, financially and time-wise to be able to uh, take more time for individual decisions, uh, uh, collective decisions where others may not. So you see I have flexible in several categories because there's different ways that the company could go um, in terms of uh, what structure to use, um, how regulations work, um, but you see it's one person, one vote, no matter how much, a sh that, that's a good distinction to make, well, how, no matter how many shares somebody owns or what proportion of the company they own. Um, almost all cooperatives, and I would say all cooperatives say, no matter how much you own uh, in proportion to others, you still have one vote, rather than having that share percentage leverage your vote. So that's the big difference. And let me go to one that might evoke some other questions. There's a whole bunch more, but we're doing more. And in fact, uh, we're doing one on governance coming up uh, February 23rd and 4th. Uh, that's what the other little flyer is. Um, just wanted to point out a, 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 a feature that a lot of people use in this distributed power. A cooperative still could be hierarchical, but the power is distributed to the people who are are doing the work, uh, recognizing that the input and expertise um, that <laughs> we'll just go there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to make sure we, so, so we have about 40 minutes left until 5 o'clock. I wanted to make sure we had plenty of time for a robust discussion and everybody could act, ask real specific questions if they would like to. And I know that, Ron, you mentioned earlier uh, that perhaps our friend Mr. Stewart might like to describe his experience as a part of a member, uh, a worker-owned cooperative. Um, yeah. Hannah, uh, would, uh, and w would you two like to talk about uh, pin-up couriers at all? I, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if, you're, if you'd like to. I was unprepared to talk. Yeah. No problem. No problem. Yeah, that'd be great. And then we'll go to Anthony. Okay. Cool. Yeah, we just, um, you can be wherever you want to be, um, but I'd ask you to use the microphone. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Hannah, and that's Danny and Shannon, and we're part of a worker co op called Pinup Posters Courier Collective. And what we do is um, we basically ride our bikes around and put up flyers for community events. Um, 
I've been doing it for about four and a half years, and Danny's been doing it for longer, seven or eight, yeah. Um, it started out as one person um, who is not here, um, but <laughs> she eventually needed to take on more people as the work got bigger and um, decided she didn't want to be a boss, so she started as a co-op, and we've just been taking on more people, and we have uh, five. <laughs> Fun making decisions. <laughs> it's always hard. <laughs> <laughs> no matter how many or few people you have, I think. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, we'll have. Uh, if you would, anyone mind if we pass around everyone's information, contact information, uh, to each other for this group? Okay. Then you, you can check out uh, the organizations that each of you will work with. That'd be great. Anthony. Hello, my name is Anthony. Uh, I own a business called Deco Resources that does environmental consulting and green design. Um, so I, uh, probably about four years ago, was looking for office space and uh, ended up at a small startup called Work Hard Pittsburgh up in uh, the Allentown neighborhood of Pittsburgh, just up from Station Square. And at the time, it was uh, just a co-working space, and uh, we were renting the building from one of the local, um, just a, a local landlord. And uh, and so in the this past year, we uh, we had about 40 or so people that were kind of using the space regularly, and uh, we wanted to leverage that opportunity to say, well, you know, what if we collectively owned this space and were able to make the uh, you know decisions about this the the space that we're in and. And, and that sort of thing. So we, uh, we created the um, cooperative, uh, which is now um, Work Hard Pittsburgh. And, uh, and so there's, uh, Ron, you might even know how many members are. I think it's coming up to 30. Yeah, it's about 30, 30 members. It, it, it varies by year. Um, and it's, so we have a process that, um, that uh, really allows us to um, make sure that members are a right fit for, for what we're doing and so that you know there's not someone coming in and, and kind of steering us in a direction that, that the rest of us don't want to go in um, and so we're, we're we have uh, monthly meetings our, our meetings are all open to the community so our next one is actually um, this week uh, this upcoming week um, we'll be having a monthly meeting and those are all online so um, if you're interested <laughs> we'd be uh, happy to, to invite you to, to look that uh, up on I Probably on Facebook. Um, I wanted to ask you, I know a lot of the people that are involved with Work Hard are, uh, prior to their involvement with Work Hard, would be what we'd call freelancers. Uh, how their working life may have, been, may have been altered by participation in this worker cooperative? Yeah, it, it's really interesting. Um, so uh, as a, a co-working space, we definitely attracted a lot of freelancers um, who were, um, you know, we would take one gig at a time, and uh, and that's really challenging. If you've ever done that, it's very difficult. And so, um, you know, we, we noticed that we had a lot of similar skills uh, and skill sets, kind of uh, developing in in that area. And so, um, through the cooperative, um, we're actually able to. Um, manage that ecosystem uh, a little bit easier so as we're we have like new sales coming in um, if it's too big for for an individual for example um, then then that member can bring it to the larger cooperative and say you know hey we have this project um, this is too big for me you know I'm gonna need a team and then uh, everyone else that's there can either say you know yeah I'm interested uh, or or not be interested <laughs> and and so then it, it really helps to um, scale that opportunity um, and so for me uh, you know my company does uh, environmental consulting so um, you know most of the businesses that are there are uh, digital media and so you know, think how does that come together um, but I've actually many times on um, proposals I'll say um, you know we can do a video about the project that we're doing so um, we actually did this for uh, a cemetery up in uh, Verona, the Penn, uh, Penn Forest uh, bar Natural Barrier P Burial Park. Um, and we actually had uh, one of the filmmakers that is out of work hard um, join us for the installation of our, our water treatment system. And, uh, and they, so they filmed the whole process and, then, and that was part of our contract. So it, was, it just made it really easy for us to, to do all of that in-house, which most traditional environmental consulting firms wouldn't be able to do so that that was really neat um, and then as far as um, just like 
general um, you know, structure, uh, it, it's great because uh, you know, we have the ability to collectively make decisions about our space in particular. So you know, as, as uh, any business, you know, your, your space is the, one of the most important things that you have uh, as a resource. You know, if, if, it, if you don't have enough space or if it's not the right type of space, you know, that can be really challenging. And so uh, we're able to work through some of those issues because you know, we've got a lot of really bright people all saying, you know, how are we going to manage this space in, in an effective way um, and, and all, all sorts of things like that. Forgive me, but I have another question. Mm -hmm. um, I know a lot of members that work hard, they came in real differently. Like some of them had a very developed business, lots of capital equipment, and lots of liquid assets to bring to the table. And then other ones were skilled, but they didn't have much capital equipment or much cash. How did that all square up and so that everybody could be a member? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so uh, there are really two. Uh, just for, for my experience, there, there are really two uh, companies there that were more like hardware focused, um, and that was my company and another company called MetaMesh, um, which does wireless networking, community wireless networking. And uh, I had a lot of materials for working on certain types of projects. They had a lot of materials for working on other types of projects, but then you know we, we found a lot of opportunities um, to you know if I, I was like I need a drill and they you know they already need an extra drill and they had an extra drill or um, you know soldering iron or something so um, that it's great to um, you know all being uh, being able to come together uh, you know we were able to share those and then that's a, a big question going forward is you know a lot of us have similar needs so we say okay um, you know we're, we're looking at getting um, a new camera for for example um, that's that's something that a lot of people at the, the co-op use and so um, you know we have robust discussions about like what is the best kind of camera that would be the most versatile for everyone, and then you know we can uh, you know if someone's already planning on making that investment, um, they can do that and then rent it out to the other members, and that's a really great way of, of just kind of sharing resources uh, in particular. I think I hope that answers your question. Do all of you guys, do all the member companies have an equal ownership stake, or do you have a different kind of structure? Yeah, so our ownership structure is really interesting. Um, so we're not fully vested yet. Um, we have a certain number of shares um, that we will max out at. Um, and, and Ron actually helped to write this, so you might be the right person to answer this. But um, <laughs> so <laughs> and so each each year, uh, if for every term, you can earn one share. So um, each year we have a distribution that's roughly 30 shares that we distribute. Um, and so either you, you, are a, a, you qualify as a member and get your share, or you do not qualify as a member and do not get a share um, if you don't meet the requirements. How you qualify? I'm sorry? Do you remember the, how you qualify? The yeah, question is so how does one qualify for, for such a share? Yeah, to qualify for a share, um, you have to, so we have very strict um, guidelines around that. Um, you have to, um, so we do have a fee, uh, and so it made a lot of sense. It's, we, we were already um, paying for the space that we're in, because you know, co-working, um, and so that, that fee of co-working is your, is your fee for membership as well. So if you've paid your, your rent, then you, um, that's one check in the box. Um, another check is uh, we have these uh, vesting hours that, um, so this is actually the first year we're going to be doing this, so this is a whole, whole thing we're going through. Um, but uh, so basically you, you have to have a certain number of hours that you uh, donate into the cooperative to, uh, that, that you have to, uh, to support the cooperative. So um, we do have, uh, you know, like we have, we have several committees. Um, for example, uh, I'm the head of the real estate committee, so that deals with everything, the physical infrastructure. We have like production committee that talks about, um, you know, all sorts of, um, you know, media production and things like that. Um, and so time on a committee will help you vest those hours. Um, so that's another check in the box. And then we have a, another set of other kind of like how else do you, um, how else do you bring, uh, you know, what other, um, 
how else do you support the co-op? So, um, you know, diversity is a big thing for us, and so we, we don't want to, um, you know, we, we want to encourage a, as diverse a group as possible, and so you know, that's something that we look at. And so, basically, if you, if you go through and you uh, hit all of these, um, these items, then you, you get your, your share. What kind of work would somebody do during their vesting hours? So, we, uh, sitting on committees is one, um, and then we have internal and external um, hours. So, if you donate, if you do something really good in the community, um, we can count those hours. Um, they have to be approved by a membership committee. Um, then, also internally, if you help another cooperative member, um, so if I were to spend a couple hours um, helping uh, one of the organizations with sustainability or something like that, then that, that also would count. Question. Um, the building where the, co the co-working space works is a rental or is owned by anyone? The question is, uh, is the facility that the Work Hard Cooperative uh, uh, occupies rented or owned by the co-op? Yep, so that was actually the main impetus for us forming as a cooperative was to purchase the building that we're in. So um, we want to um, own this. We, we, so we've actually gone through a process where we now um, are are the it, it's a little more complicated than that, but essentially we own the building. <laughs> it's it's kind of complicated, but um, it's we been, the, the yeah. transaction has been done. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so we we are we are essentially um, we are now the official building manager. So we we have complete say over the building. So the revenue from because you own the building now, the revenue that comes from rents. Is invested in the co-op and distributed among all the members. Yes. So the the, the rent from the the, the co-op as well as so there's actually um, so there's a commercial space um, and there's also two uh, two residential properties in the building. Um, so the the rent from those uh, from that's paid is goes into the cooperative and then is distributed. Yeah. So um, let's see. If, as I understand it. The members own the building, but people can use the co-working space with a dedicated space if they pay another rental. Mm -hmm. But to be a member, you pay, I think it's uh, $45 a month, $540 a year, plus the 50 hours. Yep. Yeah. So, and I just want to say our cooperative is extremely complex. <laughs> and so, if it sounds like it's like, oh my God, there's all this stuff, that's because that's that's how it works for us, and that that makes a lot of sense for just the ecosystem that we had. Um, but it does not have to be this complex. <laughs> this this is um, it 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 sounds a lot more complicated than than it really needs yeah. to be. But yeah, it's yeah. really important, I think, to point out that like. A co-op isn't necessarily any particular corporate structure, and it's not necessarily any particular governance mechanism either. It is what you want it to be. A lot of people think that co-op has a specific definition someplace of exactly how many shareholders and what the rules are, but that's not the case. Right. Um, I think Faye had a question. Yes, I, did. I know you gave an example. I don't know, Ron, if this is the only example that you use. I'm more interested in how, um, how do you as a co-op purchase a building? So, so the question is, how uh, could or would a co-op purchase a building or other real property? Yeah, the same way everyone else right. does. You get a building, you have the money, and you right. have, you, you, you uh, here, I'll take that. Okay. <laughs> uh, you, you do it the way everyone else does. You have an asset you want to buy. You have the money to do it. And you have people if who will allow you to use their money to do it, some sort of financing. Um, same way, the trouble is, uh, I, I think I passed over the slide real quick, but the banks in town aren't feeling it right yet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they don't get it, I, yeah. I think is the real um, answer. So there are w other ways to do it. For uh, instance, um, Work Hard did it with a CITF grant, <laughs> Allegheny County. And uh, Community Inve Infrastructure and Tourism Fund. Mm -hmm. So it comes from the, all the slots. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> really. But what uh, happened was um, we, we worked it through New Sun Rising, the fiscal sponsor, who lent the money to work hard to buy the building. And eventually it's using its income mm -hmm. to pay off that loan from the two apartments upstairs. And then the rents of the uh, member tenants so some tend so, uh, well, I'll not get there. Uh, and then that what is what makes the whole thing work financially. 
So the so the cooperative can buy it, own it, and operate it. So w when a co-op approaches a financier, the financier sees a corporate entity, and it. In the financier's eyes, it doesn't really matter what your governance structure is. It matters what's your income, what's been your recent income, what kind of assets do you have. And so whether you're an LLC that's owned by a handful of people or whether you're an LLC that's owned and run by a cooperative, they are still just looking at your balance sheet and your income. Yeah, and the, the other the other consideration is there. I've talked to the community development officers at various banks in town, and they say, well, if we can get someone to sign for it, that's fine, but uh, the trouble is it, they're a cooperative because they couldn't do it alone. Mm -hmm. So they've banded their resources together. So that's where that disconnect is so far. Yeah, Matt. In that they, uh, they can't, uh, I'm struggling with it. So what is the rationale, the specific rationale that this development lenders are saying? Or the conventional lenders are saying? They're the saying we need, we need, the, we need uh, a guarantor. Try to remember to repeat the question. Oh, so sorry. Yeah, the yeah. The question. Your, your, <laughs> yeah, yeah, your question, uh, Matt, was um, why don't banks see that as a workable transaction? What's their what's the, what's their problem like finding? Like they always want a guarantor, and the guarantor is the cooperative, but. Uh, many of them do that. I mean, the electrical cooperatives have billions of dollars of financing sometimes. The uh, ocean spray, and the, those they're huge. A smaller group is um, fettered by the fact that they're, they haven't been in business long, so they don't have the track record. That's, that's one of the issues, yeah. Yeah, Anthony. I'm going to give him the microphone. Oh. The, um, oh, I was sort of a, a question and or comment. Um, so that one of the challenges, as I understood it, is the guarantor still needs to have collateral. And that's really mm -hmm. just like any bank mm -hmm. you know, situation, you still have to have that uh, collateral for, for the bank to want to lend. Is that correct? So, so in, in, in five years, when the members of WorkHard, for instance, have paid in um, their $540 a year to a certain point, there will be the collateral, there, there, uh, and there will be the financial track record that they would be able to use. Until then, um, it has, there is the same uh, financial challenge just to be credible in, in the banking world. Yeah, Jake. Does, does that same financing Problem present itself then uh, when workers are buying out an existing business, or can they use the uh, assets of the the, uh, the, the thing mm -hmm. purchasing to yeah. collateralize the loan? I guess what I'm asking is if it's yeah. easier to finance if they're for buying out an owner. Yeah, so the, that's a good so yeah, the go question. Ahead. Is um, yeah. if um, if a, there's a conversion taking place of an existing firm with lots of capital and, and uh, uh, capital equipment and perhaps liquid assets, uh, does that make it easier to create a co-op and for that uh, emerging co-op entity to borrow funds for what it needs? Mm -hmm. the, uh, I'll use the New Era example. Um, the business was crashing and burning. There were assets, but they weren't going to be enough to finance the transaction. Sometimes that would work. You, you can self-finance it with the assets there, which many like um, select machines did. Basically, the the em employees bought the the owner out, two owners, little by little over uh, several years, and then at the end of those, they owned it. So they could do that something like a land contract mortgage, but it was uh, not called that. Um, in New Era, there wasn't enough value to acquire the place and then get it ready for the next stage of production. So that's where the working world stepped in. So they, they really base their decisions uh, largely, too, on the potential of the cooperative and their dedication to cooperative. They do them um, in Latin America as well as the U.S. And um, so that's where they stepped in. And they've done several of the conversions in the country. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Ron, um, I'm looking around the room, and, and I'm wondering, um, 
and, and I've participated in some PCOC, uh, Pittsburgh Chamber of Cooperative mm -hmm. events. Um, and obviously in our city, you know, uh, we're really segregated. And I don't see many non-white people participating in, in cooperative ventures or even just discussions. I'm wondering, how's PCOC working to uh, bring, more, bring more people in? Uh, we, we just do. Uh, um, we work with Ujima Collective out over in the hill. Um, we're working on a, a project that involves working with um, community members around there in the public housing uh, uh, communities and just the members of Ujima. Um, Ujima is actually, they've been, um, Ujima has been probably over perceived <laughs> as a retail place, but they're, they're a cooperative development place. They do uh, Suzu financing, they, they um, are teaching, they've done gardening um, and urban agriculture, which they're still interested in um, around the hill. Um, so we, we are involved in, with them. Uh, Black Urban Gardeners and Farmers is a, a great uh, cooperative as well, um, who are, are forming and doing gar uh, urban farms in two locations, Homewood and Uptown. And um, we're trying to, we're developing gradually a, a way to find um, opportunities for housing authority residents in certain communities to be able to um, provide the services. It's, uh, HUD calls it Section 3. It's when um, per certain procurement or services need uh, are required to be provided by residents of the communities that the, commu that the housing authority needs to do, either supplies or landscaping, things like that. So, so is we're it working with um, a few people in the city to try to make that happen. So that would be, if that comes together for cleaning, handy services, uh, home care, and things like that, that would just be totally awesome. So is it so that the residents, maybe on their own as individuals, don't have the capital to buy the equipment to do the cleaning or fixing the shelves mm -hmm. or whatever it might be? They're in. Yeah, I mean, if uh, it can get organized and, they can, and we have people who are either trained or already ready to go to do the work, then we would like to be able to help get them established so that they can be the entity to be able to do that. Uh, it's kind of uh, basic, I mean, if, if, I, if I could say which model I'm stealing from for that, it would be the Prospera model out in LA. I think, I think we have a question from the man in the red hat. Yeah, Dylan. Um, yeah, I mean, to, to your uh, question, Henry, on, on racial diversity and the development of cooperatives, um, and it was Alex, is that right? Is that your name? Anthony. Anthony. Um, I know um, I've had some conversations with uh, Josh at Work Hard uh, Pittsburgh, and, he, and, and maybe, Ron, you have some information on this too, but it might be helpful for the group, um, about some sort of diversity commitments written into your cooperative structure, like into your bylaws, that are tied to um, the, the equity and the dividends. And I thought that that was really Im amazing, you know, an opportunity that cooperatives have that maybe traditional businesses either don't have or don't do, um, which is like a commitment to that kind of diversity. Um, I don't know if Anthony or Ron could speak to yeah, that a little ahead. bit. Yeah. Here. Thanks. Um, yeah, so when we originally kind of started, um, we were very, uh, our, our community was very much uh, dominated by white males, and that just was the the way that uh, it kind of naturally happened. But we recognize that that's not the um, that's not good for anyone <laughs> to, to to have any organization dominated by uh, you know really any any group in particular. But um, so our our mission was uh, to increase the diversity. Um, so in in our operating agreement, um, we don't expect to have. Um, you know, it takes time for a business to grow before they uh, have distributions of funds. Um, so it kind of gave us uh, a, an idea, you know, we could aim to be, uh, to, to grow to be more diverse in that time. So, um, you know, what does that look like? Um, and that's, that's uh, a challenging question, question in its own right of, you know, how do you make sure that, uh, that any organization is actually, um, you know, being, um, str 
structured in a way that is favorable for the most people and not, uh, you know, and, and is creating opportunities, particularly for, uh, you know, people that are, you know, maybe not, uh, you know, that, that have challenges or, or um, you know, essentially just creating opportunities for uh, for for a variety of people so um, so in our operating agreement we have uh, structured it so that we are not able to actually make any distributions of funding until we achieve uh, certain um, goals I as far as um, diversity humans of different kinds yes <laughs> that that it's a really great model I'll just add too that um, the work hard partly owns um, Academy Pittsburgh, which is dedicated to teaching digital skills to um, people of color, minorities in the, ar around the city. So that's just been a great um, pipeline for people to come to come in into work hard that way. So yeah, here I'll pass this to you. Oh, thank you. I'm Guillermo with the Pittsburgh Hispanic Development Corporation. I just wanted to add something, um, a comment to what you just said, uh, which I believe is important um, uh, that perhaps, you know, in this uh, diversity and in close in, in inclusion in, into the cooperatives, there is a, a cross-cultural component uh, because you have people from other cultures. Uh, for example, uh, in Latin America, uh, most people open the door in their house and they have their business right there. So they don't have to go register businesses, they don't have to do, you know, they just put a sign and all that and no, nobody can say anything. So they come here to this country and they don't know how to work and operate with other businesses. So the way of thinking, the cultural component, um, you know, in order to have, for example, in the case of the Latino population, it will be important to have some kind of transitional cross-cultural strategy or something that will be inclusive of how these people, you know, think and the background and it, it actually changes from region to region. You know, everybody's from Mexico, you know, it's very different. The Central America is very different from South America. So there's a lot of those um, things that had to be erased, I think. Yeah, that's fantastic. I'm glad you're here. Because I've, I've been also reaching out to, uh, to the Nepalese Refugee Committee and, and others that would be, you know, uh, I think, uh, great parts of the whole effort. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's acculturation is going to be a big challenge for us as we become a popular spot for new people again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we'll wind up, but if anybody has any other questions, what? I just ask. have, um, it's really more of a question about how you guys see yourself supporting things like these cross-cultural efforts, and do you see yourself as a space where you're going to offer opportunities maybe for more networking among people who might not have met one another who may like to form a co-op or something like that? And um, I'm, a, I'm a librarian with the business department downtown, and I'm always looking for the right time to get people to meet each other. And, you know, it happens on the fly. I can't control it the way my work works, but I would love to be able to send people somewhere where they can meet like-minded folks. I work with a lot of ex-offenders who have decided to start their own business and are maybe feeling isolated and might like to work with other groups in that way. So, Just curious how you see your role in bringing folks well, together. That is one of our roles. We yeah. want to be the, the that, that is one of our roles. We would like to be the space uh, for everyone. I mean, I'm not the only one. We have 17 members or so, and it, that's growing. Um, and about yeah. Oh, yeah. One of the things we do, <laughs> one of the, we we play a board game called Coopoly, which is a great introduction to the, how cooperatives work. It's it's something like Monopoly, something like the game of life. You move board around. I p pulled, uh, got, I ordered ten boxes because Sprout Fund gave us a grant to do this a couple years ago, and I got, opened the box and there's one game piece. I said, Oh no, we're, what are we going to do? But Ah, <laughs> everybody's on the same team. <laughs> so that's it was it. It's been good. Uh, a lot of we get a lot of good feedback from that, uh, and we we're willing to do that. You know, in any place at the library, at uh, meetings of the of, of your organization, Guillermo. Yeah, tavern. yeah, taverns. It, there's a couple around. Uh, I think. Um, 
Repair the World has one, and there's another one someplace out there, and we have more. Um, um, but we, we have a little fund to be able to do, uh, help cooperatives get started. For that, I'm talking about maybe the, the House Cleaning Collective or something like that. How uh, would people that, find out about future networking events and opportunities like oh, that? Oh, to the website. Ta -da. <laughs> and you know, and uh, there it is. It's just pittsburghchamber.coop, like that. Do you have any more huh? questions or final thoughts or anything from-, from Any anybody? suggestions for us? Yeah. yeah, I mean, really, what we're doing here is, you know, there's, there's uh, the cooperative form it can be a very empowering uh, and, and fla flattening uh, uh, system that can really help a lot of people participate in new economic activity or old economic activity. And yet, it's sort of experiencing this little resurgence of popularity. And whenever something's popular, you've got a lot of people that heard the word but don't know what it means. Mm -hmm. So really, plain and simple, you know, uh, uh, Ron and I both believe that everyone should understand this tool because sometimes it's the right tool. Um, and, and all you guys, in one way or the other, are working with people help uh, starting or, or, or growing or, or altering new entities. So it's kind of on all of us to have sort of a, a whisper or shout campaign um, to help everybody get access to the info when they need it. Uh, Anthony? Just kind of a final um, thing from, from our side. Um, you know, really, in our experience, um, you know, the cooperative is, is really about empowering decision making, right? So it's, it's, you know, the people that are doing the work should be deciding the direction of that work. And, uh, and so Work Hard Pittsburgh has really been trying to um, do this in a transparent way. And so just, again, we are doing, um, you know, we're trying to make this available to the community so, so you can see and, and learn from our mistakes and learn from, from our success. So, um, you know, again, we're, we're having our next um, meeting, our, our general member meeting uh, on the, the 30th. And so if you want to see what a, a real life cooperative, you know, how that, how that you know, works, uh, you know, I would encourage you to, to watch that on, online. Uh, it's it's n sometimes messy, um, just like any other business. And uh, you've got a lot of people and a lot of competing interests. Um, but in the end, I, I, from from what I've seen, that's made us stronger and more robust. And you know, it really it really does give the decision making to to the people that are involved, which is amazing. So I really want to thank Ron and and Henry and everyone else for the for their support. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm Henry Horn Pyatt from Mayor Peduto's office here in the City Stats Training Room of the City County Building. Thanks everybody on YouTube and everybody on the City Cable Channel for joining us. And thanks again for everybody came, who came in person to make this a robust conversation. I hope that we can all continue working together to help explain this tool to the rest of our community and help everyone take advantage of it that would benefit from it. And uh, we'll see each other soon. Thanks. <laughs>